Good morning. We'll do our bit of our teaching moment for now, and then at 10 o'clock we'll have announcements and start the liturgy. So we welcome those who are here by way of live stream. Last week we talked a little bit about what the prayer book was and, and why it was important um, to Anglicans and Episcopalians. And, and this week I want to take up briefly another question. What is the Bible and why is it important? And we're, we're, we're sort of people that we think we know what, what it is and, and why it's important, but it, it helps to review that every once in a while. The Bible, as you know, is a collection of books divided into the Old Testament, into the New Testament, or Hebrew scriptures and Christian scriptures. And it, its importance for us is that it is the written record of the experience of God's people with God. And in the Episcopal world, in the Anglican world, we don't understand that to mean that God said, Isaiah, sit down and take a letter. Or James, listen up, I'm going to dictate something to you. But rather that as people experienced God and lived into a relationship with God, over time, it became important to write down what that was. And, and so people, probably men, wrote down the story of relationship with God. They wrote down the, the religious sacred stories of why was the world created? How did sin come into the world? How has God been active in the life of God's chosen people? So we have stories like the creation. We have the story of Adam and Eve. We have the story of the Exodus. And all of that accumulates into the story of the Gospels, God's most explicit act of revelation about who God is for us and with us. And that's why we're Christian, because that happened. And we believe that. We believe that Jesus is the incarnation of God who comes to us because God loves us and therefore redeems us and, and raises us to new life without the burden of sin. And so in, these, in this collection, this storybook, it's really a storybook, we have the Torah or the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and that's what's in the, the Torah. If you go to a synagogue or a Jewish temple, that's what's in the big scrolls, the books of Moses. They're the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Micah, Ezekiel. There are the wisdom writings, Proverbs, for example. And there are the Psalms often attributed to, to David, all 150 of them. And we know that David did not write all 150 of them, but that's really a minor detail. What the Psalms are is sort of the, the Jewish hymnal. And they were, they were the, the sacred songs of, of the faith. And then we have the Christian scriptures. And there are two kinds of writings in the scriptures of Christians. They're the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the Gospel of John. And then there are the letters, well, they're the Acts of the Apostles, and then there are the letters, the letters of Paul, the Pauline letters, the pastoral letters, and Revelation. And they're the story of what life with God in Christ is all about. For us as Episcopalians at our best, we've never taken these to be literal. The, the Bible is not the answer key in the back of your Algebra I book that had all of the odd answers in it, which all of us devotedly read uh, frequently and were frustrated when the teacher only gave the, the even-numbered problems for homework. God's like that sometimes, too. 
But the point is that the, the story, the way we see scripture, the way we engage this book of stories is as a living document or set of documents that speak to us, that God continues to speak to us. And we continue to hear through scripture what God is saying to us at this time. Yeah. And so we have to engage the scripture. We have to, to think about it and pray on it and, and question it and wonder about it. And we, we experience scripture living because sometimes it really speaks to us and sometimes it just doesn't have anything to say. And sometimes one passage just touches our heart deeply and the same passage a week later doesn't have much to say to us. So it's a living story in which we still participate. It's a living story in which we are living forward into God's plan and will. And it's a collection of stories through which God continues to speak to us, to give us guidance, to give us hope, to give us a sense of who God is and who we are, to give us a sense of what the relationship is between God and God's people. So scripture is, a, is an incredibly rich resource. But scripture is also our standard. To be a faithful Christian means we live within the parameters of scripture. And the challenge there is that sometimes it's pretty clear. Thou shalt not murder. Got it. And then there's love your neighbor as yourself, which sounds simple enough and clear enough. But you gotta, you gotta work with it, you gotta live with it, you gotta figure out what loving yourself and loving your neighbor is all about. And it's a daily process. It's a process of looking at words like, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. And, and exploring what that means. It's about taking scripture that was written in the first century, in language of the first century, and concepts of the first century, and being willing to ask, okay, so what's the point? What does that mean for us today? So the fun of scripture is that kind of give and take. It's an engagement with God. It's an engagement with ourselves. It's an engagement with each other. And it has all of the core things. And it governs our life in the sense that everything we do, we think, needs to be consistent with Scripture. So we can't say as Christians, it's okay to murder because, you know, that's an expedient way of dealing with people. Scripture doesn't allow that. We can't say, I don't want to love my neighbor. I hate my neighbor. Scripture doesn't allow that. Jesus is the Christ of God, is a core value. If you're going to be Christian, that has to be a yes. Okay? So my, my recommendation to you is to take up Scripture. Don't try to read it like a novel, starting at Genesis 1 because I can tell you by the time you get midway through Leviticus, you're going to be worn out. Take the lectionary, the daily office lectionary in the back of the prayer book and read a bit each day. Maybe the way you do it is for a month, read the Old Testament lesson and for a month, read the epistle and for the next month, read the gospel and then start over again with wherever it is on the day. There's a lesson for every single day. Or maybe you just want to focus on a particular book, a gospel, a prophet, an epistle. Engage the book. It is for us the sacred scriptures. 
It is for us the holy texts that tell us who God is and who we are and what the foundation of our living is. And when we take scripture and combine it with the prayer book, we have two resources of dialogue and relationship with God that shape our relationship and dialogues with one another. Okay. So that's it for this day. Announcements. A couple of things. In your bulletin, you will find the day school fall plant sale. Um, Edie said it's a little tight this year because that's the way it turned out. So if you would like to buy mums in support of the day school, the form is in your bulletin. Um, fill it out and write a check, and you can put it in the offering plate when you come up for communion if you want, or leave it on top of the piano uh, after church, or call the office by Tuesday at noon to place your order. It's eight inch pots, seven dollars a piece, red, yellow, bronze, and purple. And that's their, their fall fundraiser. Um, the other thing is a liturgical note. Uh, we're in right to for a while. And what we're gonna do with prayers of the people is use all of them. And so each week the prayers of the people is going to be a different form uh, from the Book of Common Prayer. And so last week we started with Form 1, this week is Form 2, next week will be Form 3, and then we'll just start all over again. Um, part of that is just to, to use the resource that's there for us in our prayers. And part of it is to give you an experience of that variation and uh, see where it takes us. It seems to me we do a lot of things over and over and over and over, the same, the same, the same. And maybe sometimes our prayer life needs the little jolt of doing it slightly different so we remember what we're doing and why. Okay. Jim, you had something you wanted to announce. Thank you, Jim, for our off-screen audience. That was a petition uh, request by Jim that there's a person whom he knows, a, a woman who is in need of some assistance in terms of bedding and some simple furniture, a kitchen table and a couple of chairs and kitchen things like pots, pans, plates. And if you, if you have any of these things that you could could donate, please do so, and you can bring them by um, the church, and Jim will see that uh, she gets them. Um, Jim, this, Jim knows this woman, and, and his comment about her is that even though she's on dialysis and, and life is rough, that when you ask her how she is, I'm always good, I'm good, I'm good. So this is an opportunity for us, if you have some things, that you can part with, um, <coughs> furniture, bedding, bed, kitchen wares and stuff. Um, here's an opportunity to give them a new home and uh, help this woman out. So if you can, let us know, come bring the things to the office and that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Jim. Anything else? 
let us prepare our hearts and minds to make our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to Almighty God.
Just write to page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are opened, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, because without you we are not able to please you, Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from Isaiah. The Lord... The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. The psalm appointed this morning is a portion of Psalm 116. We will read it together by the whole verse. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because, because he, he has, has inclined his ear, inclined to, his ear to me whenever I call upon him. The cords of death entangle me. The grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray to you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord watches over the innocent. I was brought very low, and he helped me. Turn, Turn again, again to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has treated you well. For you have rescued my life from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. A reading from James. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If he puts bits, 
bits into the mass of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at the ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is, and the, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world, as a world of inequity. It stains the whole body. It sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of, of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed, and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. And with it we bless the Lord, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring, does a spring forth from the same opening, uh, both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs, or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the people of God. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea and Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Jesus asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As always, the lesson from Isaiah starts us off on a good footing. And, and it was especially heartening to me to, to begin with, the Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher. Um, and there are others in the congregation who are comfortable with that. You've been teachers our teachers. And the thing that, that Isaiah is saying in this part of Isaiah, which is the second part, so he's talking to a people in exile. He's talking to the people of God in Babylon. And he's talking about teaching in the sense that, that where or at least in part, the sense where Israel always got in trouble was when they forgot what God had taught them, when they forgot the lessons that they had learned, when their teachers were not good and didn't teach them well how to live with God. And so teaching is an extremely important, serious matter that's not just about the conveyance of information or data. It's about the forming and the shaping of a person who is learning. Their thinking, their understanding, their capacity to respond, their capacity to, to be creative. I mean, there are all those, for example, stories about children learning to color within the lines. Now, as you know, most little guys have no respect for lines on the page whatsoever. The, the exercise is all about color and, and making lots of colors together. And then they get in school and the teacher teaches them, well, you have to stay within the lines. 
And for some kids, that's crushing. It, it, it sucks the creative air out of them. It's not a discipline. It just is, is a crushing of their creativity. Now, for other kids, it's about learning a discipline. And for others, I had a parishioner in New London who was a very talented artist. And he had a wonderful, interesting style. He knew how to draw within the lines when he needed to, and he could make things look very realistic. But his sky was as likely to be orange or green as it was to be blue. And sometimes it was red and orange and green and blue. So teaching is, teaching is a subtle kind of thing. And it has impacts. It impacts those whom we teach, our children, ourselves, our friends. And so the prophet was recalling to Israel to remember what you have learned. And if you are a teacher, do it well. Because what is at stake is the heart and soul and mind and well-being of the student. And then we get to James, and sort of the mood changes entirely. I, I suspect that James's community had been undergoing a siege where um, some chatting around the edges, the parking lot conversations, and other miscellaneous malicious gossip had become a problem. And, and James was really getting on their case about using their tongue and pointing out to his community and to us how malicious we can be verbally. And like teaching, that has impacts, some of which we know, some of which we intend, some of which we don't intend, and some of which we never know. But what we say and what we don't say how we say it and when we say it matters. Carl Dudley, who was one of the early leaders in congregational development, talked about small parishes and, and he said, you know, the thing we, we always hear that gossip is a terrible thing. And he said, in a small parish, gossip is an essential thing. Think about this for a minute. Because gossip is not in a small parish, in a small town, necessarily malicious or trying to get at somebody or, have you heard? But Carl Dudley said, my experience of it is it's news. It's the way the community shares its news. Did you hear that Mabel had a fall and she's not doing well? We need to do something. Can you believe what my kid did? Can you believe what your kid did? <laughs> that, it's, that it's a way of, of communicating and it's a way of being connected. It's a way of, of being in touch. And that's a whole different thing from malicious gossip, which is intended to hurt. It's intended to spread bad news. It's intended to say bad things. Now, of course, we in the South all know that the cover for that is that wonderful phrase, bless your heart. And, and bless your heart determines the whole tone of what the conversation is going to be. But what James wants us to remember is that the tongue, our speaking, has great power, and because it has great power, how we use it is extremely important. It has the power to build up, the power to encourage, the power to give hope, the power to express sorrow, the power to express lament, the power to articulate commitments, and it has the power to destroy and maim and hurt and undermine. 
not only is language important, but how we speak it. And we as Christian people have vowed to seek and serve Christ and all people. And that means to use all of the resources, including our speech, to seek and serve Christ and all people. And you and I know we live in a world where language has become weaponized in perhaps a way that we haven't seen for decades and decades. And we as Christian people have at least two responses to that. One is not to engage in that kind of speaking. And two is to resist it, to call people when they do it. Now, we may not do that in the middle of a rally, a, a public rally at a political contest, but we can talk to each other. We can talk with our friends. Our friends can talk with their friends and their friends with their friends. Keep this image in your head. A study was once done on the impact of how car dealerships treat customers, good and bad. And what the study found was that every time somebody walks into the car dealership, 250 contacts also walk into that dealership. And so if they're not treated well, and they talk to their friend, and their friend talks to their friends, 250 people later, damage has been done. So it really is a moment of empowerment to realize that how each of us individually takes a stand about how we use the resource of speech does matter. It does have impact. It can help to shape our world and our conduct and our speaking with each other in a better kind of way. The gospel has a series of interesting speakings by Jesus. Mark 8 is right before the middle of the gospel of Mark. And this passage comes from just before the transfiguration. And Jesus is beginning to set them up for what is to come. Jesus is beginning to teach the disciples where the past three years with him is going to end up. And so he asks them, who do you say that I am? Who do people say that I am? All kinds of answers there, none of which are correct. Then he says, but who do you say I am? You guys, you have spent the past three years with me. You know me better than anybody. Who do you say that I am? And our good friend, Peter the Impulsive, says, you are the Messiah. You're the Christ. And what does Jesus do? He sternly tells them, don't tell anybody that. The mark in secret. And why? We get a little bit of a clearer sense of this in the Gospel of John. Remember, John always talks about the hour has not yet come. Well, that's what Jesus was dealing with here. The hour had not yet come. And of course, we also remember that when he had done that before, when he did healings, it wasn't very successful. So we've got this, this tension here about who Jesus is and when the right time is to realize that he's the Christ. But the time's not yet, Peter. And then Peter compounds the whole thing by pulling him aside when Jesus says, okay, this is what's going to happen to me. I'm going to suffer. 
I'm going to be persecuted, I'm going to be killed, and on the third day I rise from the dead. And Peter pulls him aside and says, you can't do that, that's not right, that's not right. And Peter gets a stern rebuke. Why? Because Peter is just undermining the confession that he made. He didn't get what Jesus was saying. I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be persecuted, I'm going to be killed, and on the third day I'm going to rise. Peter didn't hear that last phrase at all, didn't know what it meant. And the idea that Jesus would be persecuted and suffer and die was just beyond his thinking. And Jesus probably knew that. I doubt that Jesus was surprised that Peter didn't get it. but he had to call him on it. And what did you hear? Get behind me, Satan. Remember back in the beginning of his ministry when he was in the desert being tempted, the temptation? And the close of the story is always, and Satan left to return at the appropriate time. Well, Satan returned, but Satan was early. So we put all of this together. And then we have Jesus say to the people, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. Not his cross, my cross, your cross, and follow And what Jesus is, I think, trying to get across to us is that the way of Jesus has to include suffering and persecution and death for two reasons. The first is that in Jesus, God is taking in all of the created order in its present state, all of it. Not the good stuff, the happy stuff, the fun stuff, the feel-good stuff, but all of it. The sin, the brokenness, the pain, the tragedy, everything that is demeaning, disgusting, horrible, terrible about human being and the state of creation is being embraced by God and Jesus. And he can't, he cannot not do that. And all of that must be done before the crucifixion and the resurrection on the third day. And it's only in the light of an experience of that risen life in Christ, what the baptismal collect calls the new life of grace, that we get it. Now, poor Peter didn't know what the answer was. He was just horrified that all of this stuff would happen to Jesus. But you and I get to see it always in the light, not just of suffering and persecution and death, but resurrection and new life. And so part of what we are called to do in taking up our cross is to take up the whole of life as Jesus took up the whole of life. <clears throat> to engage in all of life, the, law, the part that is good and strong and healthy and joyous, and the part that is broken and sorrowful and painful and hideous. And in the name of Jesus, embrace it as Jesus did. And in the power of the Spirit, speak word of comfort and hope. In the name of God, to do those things which we can do, which build up God's creation, which heal God's creation, 
which make us whole and human and holy as God has created us to be. To take up the cross is not to take up Jesus' cross. Jesus already did that. To take up our cross, you and me, simply means and complicatedly means to embrace the world with the same wholeness and unreserved, unrelenting love that God and Jesus did and does. It is to open ourselves to be so filled with God's Spirit that we empty the junk in us in order to be filled with the life in God and to do the work God is giving us. It may seem small. It may not be possible for us to see the impacts of what we do and how we do it, what we say and the ways we say it. What Isaiah and James and Mark remind us today is that it matters. It does matter. It does matter because what we do and what we say, what we do not do and what we do not say impacts God's world and that impacts God's beloved. It matters who we are and how we are in God's world. And the good news, as we stand before that humongous task, is that week by week, God in Christ through the Spirit comes to feed us. That week by week, God in Christ comes to remind us that God is with us. God is in us. God is through us. Day by day in our conversation with God, the same is affirmed as God comes to us through the Son and the Spirit. And what does all that mean? That no matter how bad things are, no matter how good things are, no matter where we are, we can do, we are empowered to do the work God is giving us for the good of God's creation and all who dwell therein. And this is good news. This is good news. We shall not be overcome. And we can do what is needful. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, 
true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and sitting at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. For the prayers of the people, we will use form two, found on page seven of the uh, bulletin and found on page 385 of our prayer book. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our bishops and other ministers, especially Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Samuel, our diocesan, Anne, our suffragan, and William, our interim rector, and for all clergy and people, for this gathering, and for all ministers, and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. And we ask for the goodwill in our nation. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially Portia Paris, for those who died from Hurricane Ida, for those who died in the 9-11 attacks, and for their families and friends who mourn their deaths. Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for Tish, Kathy, Janet, Steve, Sam, Ann, Mary Beth, June, the Saxton family, Brother Stephen, Stan, Mike, James, Pierre, Marie Noel, Mary, Lisa, Francine, Ann, Jana, Cindy, Mike, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Ann and Dan, Mitchell, Addison and family, Mary and family, Nathan and family, Angela and Chris and Claire. For those who suffer and are rebuilding after Hurricane Ida, and for those in our military, Michael McCloskey, Blair Crowder, Ben Shepard, Horace Honeycutt, Jonathan Romero, Hunter Knoll, and Jim Donovan. I ask your thanksgiving for those celebrating a birthday this week. Ann Doniker, Pat Feller, 
Ches Kennedy, Dot Riley, and Karen Richardson. And for Clark and Susan Turner, who just celebrated their 44th anniversary. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored, especially St. Thomas, our patron, whom we remember today. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have not done. We have not all done you. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorrow, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your way. The glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and sacrifice to God. Let us, with gladness and thanksgiving, offer to the Lord the symbols of our life and our labor.
All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. Amen. The Holy Eucharist is offered to the glory of God and in thanksgiving for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with special intention this day for those who suffer in this world from its brokenness, from our sinfulness, from tragedies, and especially we remember in this weekend those who died and those who mourn in the tragedy of 9-11. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with Mary the God-bearer, St. Thomas, our patron, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sin of the world, the gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Christ to the cup of salvation. The blood of Christ to the cup of salvation. body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. Body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. body and blood of Christ given for you. The 
body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. body and blood of Christ given for you.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and evermore.
Though in peace, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. <laughs>